Hello students and welcome to this lecture on plant containment. This is part of your plant molecular biology course IB6043. Today I will be discussing about plant containment and the various techniques associated with plant containment from the perspective of a molecular biologist. So what happens when you are uh, involved in working with different kinds of plants, especially in situations which warrant quarantine. As you may be aware, plant pathogens can pose a significant risk to the economy of any country. And this has been evident in many cases when plant pathogens have invaded the country via fruits which are transported or grains which are shipped without proper quarantine. And then these pathogens pose a risk to the local land races or the local crops. Yeah, and you may also be aware of the situations in which a genetically modified plant may also pose a risk to other native plants via the transfer of genetic material through pollen grains. So some of the factors which we should be aware of are molecular breeding methods which is basically genetic engineering of plants the internationalization of trade which uh, pertains to the shipment of seeds as well as fruits and other agricultural products across borders, the emergence of disease resistant pathogens in response to the excessive use of pesticides, uh, biological control agents which can be used to limit pests without the use of pesticides and the compliance with national laws. Now this lecture has been designed for a, a Malaysia specific approach to containment and I will be discussing some biosafety regulations during the course of this lecture. Okay, These are some of the objectives of this particular lecture module. I am going to introduce you to the concepts of plant containment. I am going to discuss relevant situations which require plant containment the national laws, policies and guidelines pertaining to plant containment, national procedures, international guidelines, the design of plant in vitro facilities and the design of the transgenic plant containment facilities. What are your learning outcomes? So upon le completion of this module, you should be able to describe situations in which plant transgenic containment is needed. You should be able to describe the relevant national laws related to the development of living modified organisms or LMOs. You should demonstrate the ability to access and to understand international and national policies and guidelines. And you should be able to dis uh, develop a conceptual design for a plant transgenic containment facility. These are your learning outcomes. Now when we design this course, we look at situations in which your employer or your research institution may require you to uh, conduct a risk assessment and propose a risk mitigation for that particular risk. So this lecture has been formulated to address that need. Now when we refer to containment, we need to understand the concepts of containment which are primary and secondary containment and when do we need to resort to this containment. Okay, So when we look at biosafety with regard to transgenic plants, we are basically trying to limit the spread of the transgenic material via pollen and this is why transgenic plants must be contained in a containment facility and they must also comply with the specific national requirements for biosafety and biosecurity. I will explain to you in graphics what I refer to as primary and secondary containment. So when we have a biohazard or a hazard in which in this case may be a pathogen or a plant which is being genetically modified or a pathogen which infects specific plants, 
we need to contain this particular biological agent in order to prevent it from causing harm to the laboratory users as well as to the environment and to the community. So if you look at the first level of containment, it's the primary containment. So if you can look here, this is the laboratory user and this is the biological agent and this represents primary containment. Now secondary containment basically refers to the environment. So we want to prevent this particular biological agent from accessing the open environment and this requires the use of specific containment facilities. Now when we have a breach of containment, we mean that this biological agent has crossed these barriers and either infected the personnel or the environment. So breach of containment is something which we all try to avoid under all working circumstances. Okay, so primary containment basically is <clears throat> the purpose is to protect the laboratory user from the biological agent and secondary containment the purpose is to protect the environment from the biological agent. Now when it comes down to plants, plants uh, are not going to harm humans and plant pathogens in general do not pose a res risk to human health. However, they can pose a risk to the environment in terms of the other plants as well as to local wildlife. Okay, there are some situations during which you have to resort to containment. So if you have genetically modified plants, obviously you have containment. When you import planting material, you may have to resort to containment in order to comply with phytosanitary regulations. Plants which have been cultured in vitro may also require containment as these tissue cultured plants may not be strong enough to resist pathogens when released into the field and may require a certain period of hardening and adaptation. Challenge tests involving pathogens and pests. In this case, I am referring to a pathogen test in which you take a new variety of plant and expose it to a pathogen in the greenhouse to check for resilience. And in these cases, you need to resort to containment or else you will risk releasing that particular pathogen in the environment and harming the local land races of plants. And the last case is controlled breeding experiments. This is done by a commercial company. So they conduct controlled breeding experiments in which the parental genotype is well defined or determinate. And they cannot allow uh, pollen from other donor plants to enter into the containment facility. So this is when control breeding experiments must be conducted under containment. Okay, so there are risks associated with different plants. For example, genetically modified plants, if not contained, you may have the issue of transgene escape via pollen. These plants may also have impact on pollinators as some research publications have stated or documented. There can also be an issue of bioterrorism if plants are basically transported out of the laboratory into a region in which you have native plants and if this is done deliberately it constitutes an act of bioterrorism. And there can be also economic impacts as certain plants, if genetically modified, may not be imported into other countries because of their specific regulations pertaining to GMO plants. Another aspect is quarantine of imported planting material. So imported planting material may consist of exotic species which may be invasive and displace the local endemic plants. So this is another reasons why you have to resort to containment in order to establish a quarantine protocol. You also have plants developed in vitro. So plants developed in vitro are basically tissue cultured plants. They may not have an intact cell wall or the cell wall may be weak 
and when you transport these plants into the environment they may not be in a position to resist the local pathogens or the clim climatic conditions so in this case we need to resort to containment in order to harden the plants prior to release into the environment And there are control breeding experiments. So in control breeding experiments, we have determinate hybrids in which the two parental genotypes are contained within a greenhouse facility in order to ensure that the progeny are determinate or derived from the original parental genotypes. Then we have challenge tests. In challenge tests, we try and introduce a new plant to a new pathogen. So we have an interaction between the pathogen and the plant and in this case we have to resort to containment because we cannot risk the release of that pathogen into the environment. Let us look at some of the guidelines for containment. This is just a general list. You may have to refer to these later. So we have the International Plant Protection Convention and we have the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service and we have the NIH guidances for general containment guidelines. Okay, so in plants just as in other pathogens we have biosafety levels and biosafety levels provide a description of the combination of administrative controls, work practices and procedures, equipment and facility features which are required to achieve a designated level of containment. So these are designated as BSLs. So we have BSL 1 to 4 for general pathogens and BSL 1 to 4 with a P suffix for plant containment. If you refer to the NIH guidelines, you will see, you will find Appendix P in which you have specific guidelines related to recombinant DNA research involving plants according to specific risk criteria. Now, please take note that if you refer to recent publications, you will note that certain viral vaccines are developed using plants as the phyto farming approach to vaccine development. And these plants definitely need to be contained as we cannot risk release of these viral coat proteins via pollen into the general plant population as this can create additional issues in the future both in terms of health issues as well as legislative and regulatory issues. Okay, in Malaysia we have the Malaysian Biosafety Act 2007 which specifically relates to the modification of material you, uh, like plant material using specific gene constructs and this requires notification and specific permission for release of these plants into the environment. Okay, so these are some of the interpretations of the act. So when we need to notify the authorities is when you do uh, in vitro nucleic acid technique. You inject nucleic acids into the cell's organelles. You fuse cells as a part of a fusion experiment. And then you insert new uh, genetic elements such as promoters and regulators or enhancers into your genetic material. Or when you modify your planting material in a way that is deviates significantly from the original parent plant. Okay, so let us look at what is defined as genetic modification. So you have genetic transformation with vectors or by mechanical means such as microinjection or biolistics. Then you have protoplast fusion in which case you fuse two cells from different plants using a technique such as electroporation or you use a an agent to fuse two different cell types and you finally have recombinant plant products containing DNA for instance you can use a plant to produce a vaccine or an enzyme for from an animal using a plant so these fall into the domain of genetic modification.
one must take note that for instance inserting a gene from an animal species into a plant may also have issues regarding vegetarianism and ethical considerations okay when we have a generalized approach to genetic modification we need to do a risk assessment we need to apply to the ibc what is known as an institutional biosafety committee and this in turn will vet your application and forward it to the genetic modification advisory council or gmac in order to grant approval for permission to conduct that particular experiment note that all genetic modification must obtain approval even though you may not intend to release that particular plant into the external environment experiments themselves require notification and permission so plants have biosafety levels as well generally the biosafety levels were developed by the world health organization to categorize the pathogens into the risk groups 1 2 3 and 4 but if you refer to the nih guidelines with appendix p you will find some references to plant biosafety levels Okay, so you have BSL-1 to 4P with increasing level of risk. So BSL-1P is basically a low level of containment for transgenic plants. And if this plant cannot survive outside of the greenhouse, it's basically a BSL-1P. By greenhouse, I refer to the containment facility itself. And if this plant is released, it does not pose any risk to the environment. So BSL2P is posing a certain level of risk. So this plant is viable in the environment if released from the greenhouse or the containment facility, but it has a negligible impact and can, which can easily be managed. Then we have BSL3P, which are organisms which can have a detrimental impact on the environment and also in the case of infectious agents for instance a researcher may intend testing whether a plant is resistant to a specific fungal or bacterial pathogen which causes wilt and if this pathogen should escape into the environment it will also cause wilt or pathogenesis in local plants and this is when we must designate this particular plant, uh, plant in the risk group of BSL3P and then you have BSL4 which is related to infectious agents which are serious pathogens of major crops so this refers to pathogens which may infect more than one crop in a particular geographical region and you should take note of one thing is that certain pathogens which are endemic in for example in temperate countries may be exotic and pathogenic in tropical countries and vice versa this needs to be taken into consideration when doing your risk assessment now that we know about the different levels we look at the biological risk in terms of managing it and please be aware that in your future career as a research officer or a scientist you may be required to manage biological risk at your respective organization or institution now biological agents in themselves do not pose a risk rather it is the operations conducted with biological agents which increase the risk of exposure the risk of release and the risk of the breach of containment so what we do as researchers is we determine the level of risk then we apply the measures to contain the risk and what remains after these measures have been applied is what is referred to as residual risk now if the residual risk is acceptable we proceed to work with it if it is not acceptable we terminate or eliminate the experiment 
and what we need to look at is the guidelines as well. So working with a risk group must comply with specific regulatory frameworks and guidelines or else you and your institution can open yourself up to legal action. So risk is defined in terms of likelihood and consequence. So for instance, if I'm working with a transgenic plant, I may look at likelihood in terms of what is the probability of the pollen fertilizing native species and the consequence. So what will be the measurable impact of this event on the local ecology and economy? Okay, let's look at it from an example point of view. For instance, if I'm going to introduce a genetically modified strain of corn or genetically modified variety of corn in a region where corn is grown and where there is a native species of corn. Now there is a risk of exposure of the native land races or native species of corn to the exotic species via the pollen because corn after all is wind pollinated. So if this does occur, there is a probability that the plant which is native may get genetically modified by the exotic variety of corn which I planted. So we have to design, uh, define the risk in terms of these two factors when it comes down to genetic modification as well as the economic impact of this on the country as a whole. What we resort to when we do uh, bio risk management is the AMP model in which we assess the risk, we mitigate the risk using specific controls and then we assess the performance of those controls using a performance audit. This is the general AMP model for bio-risk management and it is a cyclical approach which means that we constantly improve upon our risk assessment and we constantly improve upon our risk mitigation factors to achieve an ideal situation of containment. Okay, a risk assessment is basically asking questions about a specific procedure, about a specific pathogen and arriving at conclusions. Let us take the example of the transgenic corn. I am going to import transgenic corn into my country and I am going to grow that corn in a containment facility. Now the risks with that may be multiple, for instance the risk of that plant spreading its pollen to local corn plants and the risk of those corn plants acquiring gain of function or so for instance gain of function refers to increased resistance and the impact of that on the economy as well as on the local farmers. These are the questions which one needs to address when one conducts a risk assessment. Now there are no specific questions for risk assessment in terms of a specific plan. These may change based on the circumstances, your region as well as your facilities. So some of the pertinent questions or generic questions are, has the organism been genetically modified? Is there any documentary evidence indicating that the recombinant protein is toxic to animals? For instance, I'm producing a vaccine protein in a plant. So if I grow this plant in the environment, will that particular protein be toxic to animals? What is the lethal dose of the recombinant protein produced in plants? Can the trait or the gene encoding the recombinant protein be transmitted via pollination? And what is the maximum distance to which the pollen will travel under ambient environment conditions? Now this question can be addressed by using what are known as sentinel plants. You have your plant which is the genetically modified one within your containment facility and you can grow the native plants within the perimeter of this facility at a specified distance maybe 1 kilometer, 500 meters, 100 meters and then you test those plants for transgenic genes using a standard molecular biology approach. So that's what I mean by 
the maximum distance to which pollen will travel under ambient environmental conditions. We also have to note that researchers must be trained in containment. So have the researchers received adequate training? And finally, of course, will the project be carried out under containment? So these are some of the questions which a biosafety officer will pose to a researcher or who, what is known as a principal investigator. And the researcher will answer these questions and the biosafety officer then goes through the process of risk assessment in terms of the likelihood and containment and the consequence. Now, when we look at risk groups, we have the four risk groups and we can assign that particular plant which has been genetically modified into any one of the four risk groups. Okay, we now move into risk mitigation. Now, as the word suggests, mitigation refers to the reduction of risk by the application of pertinent controls. We have five basic controls, which are elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. Okay, so you look at elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment. Now, elimination is resorted to when the experiment is too dangerous to conduct and you just eliminate it because it's too risky, it cannot be controlled. Substitution basically refers to the replacement of a plant with another plant which is attenuated or weakened. For instance, if I have a plant that contains a genetically modified trait, I can render the plant sterile. So, the plant is sterile, it cannot transmit that trait via pollen or other gametes. So, you have a substitution in that case. Engineering controls refers to the specific facilities such as buildings and directional airflows for containment of a plant which has been genetically modified. Administrative controls refer to standard operating procedures, organizational structures and policies related to genetically modified plants under containment. And finally, you have personal protective equipment which is the gloves, the masks and other equipment which you accouter yourself with to protect yourself from the biological agent. So elimination, as I said, refers to the decision to stop an experiment or cease an experiment in, in case the risk is too high. Substitution refers to the replacement of the procedure with an alternative one or the restriction of the plant, for instance, a sterile plant for the containment of the pollen. Engineering controls refers to the HEPA filters, the building design, the directional airflows, all of which will contain the organism within a specific facility. I will be discussing that during the course of this lecture when we discuss greenhouse design. And then we have administrative controls. So these are very important. We have standard operating procedures, internal and external audits, training of personnel, community, communicating risk and surveillance programs. Now please take note that all these controls work in harmony with each other. Then you have personal protective equipment, which is the protective equipment which protects you yourself from the biological agent. Okay, what should be noted is that you cannot look at these controls in silo. So when you have a personal protective equipment, you need to have a standard operating procedure associated with that. Now that is an example of a, a two controls working in harmony with each other. When you have an engineering control such as a greenhouse, you need to have a standard operating procedure in order to enter the facility and exit the facility. So all these procedures are uh, basically defined under administrative controls and these procedures must be applied when you use any of the other controls such as engineering controls or personal protective equipment. Now performance assessment 
is basically an audit of your facility. So in performance assessment, you ask yourself, are my control measures actually working? Is my risk assessment valid? And these are issues which you address in performance assessment. For instance, if I am using a specific control measure such as a engineering facility or a filter to filter out pollen at my greenhouse, but I realize that the pollen is still getting across and there is a breach of containment. I need to go back and look at my risk assessment again and my performance assessment should address that particular risk. Okay, And then I look at my engineering controls as well. So what we do is we conduct an audit and this brings us down to the issue of documentation. When we conduct any kind of bio-risk management program, we must do what we write and write what we do in accordance with our GLP or General Good Laboratory Practice Guidelines. Now this ensures that we have documentary evidence of all events or procedures which occur at our facility. A good bio-risk management pr protocol will also employ what is known as the accident reporting and incident reporting. These will ensure that your accidents as well as your incidents are reported so that future researchers or your biosafety managers can then intervene and apply suitable measures or controls for the assessment of these risks and mitigation of these risks as well. Okay, now one of the uses of sentinel plants are basically plants of the same species which are planted outside your facility which can be utilized to determine if there is any transgene escape via pollen. So these plants are grown around the facility and then if there is a breach of containment one can use a molecular technique such as PCR to look at genes in those particular plants for evidence of breach of containment. Okay, now let's come down to facility design. So facility design is basically the design of a facility such as a greenhouse for containment. And facility design is one of the key concepts of containment. Now, when designing a facility, one needs to have the engineers and the architects working together with the biologists in order to come out with a viable solution. Engineers cannot understand the biological concepts. Uh, these are too complex and biologists cannot understand the engineering concepts uh, these are not in their domain of understanding so they need to work together and come at a consensus now engineering controls basically work in terms of airflow air is a very powerful medium which can be used for containment by directing its flow and its pressure okay i'll give you a simple example when you enter a mall or a supermarket you will notice that there's an air curtain which directs airflow at the entrance now this basically drives the air downwards over you and uh, basically drives off pathogens or spores which may be on your body and on your clothes so this is an example of uh, directional airflow now in containment facilities a negative pressure is maintained which means that uh, pressure within a facility of air is lower as compared to the ambient environmental air pressure and this ensures that everything flows into the facility and nothing flows out whatever flows out flows out through a HEPA filter and this ensures that the spores or the pollen is contained within a specific facility so direction airflow is something which you can look up for future reference okay so when we have a containment facility I look at what is known as a design philosophy of containment so we have to have administrative controls and these form the heart of containment and these are basically endorsed by the Institutional Biosafety Committee. Within a contained environment, of course, you have a physical structure, you have a directional airflow, so air is contained within that facility to limit the breach of containment. You have multiple levels of redundancy, so if there's a failure at one level, for instance, your compressor fails or your uh, your centrifugal fans fail you have a second backup to prevent containment or breach of containment then as plants are 
basically growing and the required inputs in terms of light and humidity and temperature these need to be controlled as well electronic controls and monitoring systems have to be in place as human operators cannot control these facilities there are servo motors and they uh, have feedback mechanisms and these all needs to be controlled using electronic controls measures we need to have a proper waste disposal system and effluent disposal system as all the waste coming out from the facility including water has to be contaminated and decontaminated uh, subsequent to release into the environment and then we have to have physical security as well as there may be a chance of theft or likelihood of theft of the valuable transgenic material okay when we consider designing this facility we also have to define the purpose we have to ensure that it complies with local laws and standards we have to define the type of research as well as the volume of research as commercial research involving breeding may require a larger facility which involves a higher cost and the construction and operational cost please note that operational costs of containment facilities are very high as they require periodic maintenance as well as breakdown maintenance and this can add significantly to the cost of an operation okay this is the process of design so we look at client requirements so the client defines the budget as well as his or her requirements we provide an initial design and assessment in compliance with existing laws and guidelines we construct the facility with periodic inputs from the clients at each uh, critical stage and these may be some very fine tuning of the facilities even such as bench height in case you are having benches to grow your plants uh, specific lighting requirements for specific plants as well as uh, pumps and motors for irrigation of these plants so this is a fine tuning approach to facility design and then we have certification of facility so certification may require a local governing body for certification and please note that certification can be in multiple levels it may require a certification in terms of occupancy certificates from local authorities as well as the certification of the procedures and protocols by the regulatory bodies associated with genetic modification Okay, so this is an example of a containment facility. If you note that, you will see some very interesting design features. Now, I have deliberately highlighted the size of this building. If you note that, this building is basically the control structure. So it contains the compressors, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, the controls for the different uh, pumps and servos, and this is the actual facility itself. So you can see the relative scale of the facility. So you require to have a large engineering facility in order to control a small containment facility. This is one of the design considerations which one needs to take into account when uh, assigning space for a facility. Okay, so the standard layout is basically adjacency. So you need to design labs and facilities so that they are adjacent to each other in order to ensure operational workflows you ensure that you have dirty to clean work areas and you have adequate provisions for engineering controls as well as for decontamination of waste prior to release okay this is a standard layout so we have a staging area so a staging area is basically an area in which your plants come into the facility they will be definitely under some form of containment such as specific packaging so one needs to have a staging area from the staging area you can move into the next area so i have indicated as a control and monitoring area the staging area this control and monitoring area may consist of cctvs to monitor what is coming in as well as security measures to ensure that records are maintained so we have an entry and exit area in which you have a a directional airflow to direct the airflow in such a manner so as to ensure that spores and pollen do not get into the facility okay, and then you have your laboratory facilities 
So from the staging area, you proceed to entry and exit and into the laboratory. You have an autoclave facility, of course, which ensures that everything that comes out from the facility is autoclaved. It's a decontamination protocol. And then you have your greenhouses and high containment facilities. So now anything which comes into this facility through this laboratory enters into the greenhouse area and then it is basically autoclaved on its way out. So as a general practice in containment facilities, we do not permit the release of any material back into the system unless it is autoclaved and destroyed prior to disposal. Okay, and then we work from clean to dirty, so we have highly contaminated and site and we have a sterile area. Okay, so we have a media preparation area in most facilities. So this is where we prepare the soil and media and where it's sterilized prior to the introduction of the plants. So upon completion of all the processes, all media and plants and PPEs used in this facility must be sterilized and generally we incinerate it after autoclaving. Okay, genetically uh, modified plants have to be modified within the safety of a biological safety cabinet and this ensures that any genetically modified material is contained within the facility itself. And then we have the plant growth rooms. Plant growth rooms are independent and they are specific units in which the growth conditions are regulated for the optimal growth of plants. And we have ancillary equipment such as pumps and other mechanical instruments which control the environment and the humidity and temperature in the facility. So all facilities basically have a HEPA filtration system. So HEPA refers to the high efficiency particulate filters. So all air entering facilities is filtered by a HEPA filter which ensures that no pollen, no pathogens, no spores enter the facility disrupt the operation. And in order to ensure that we have containment and to protect the environment, we have filters which regulate the flow of air out into the environment. So these filters filter out all spores, pathogens and other particulates before being released, before the air is actually released into the environment. Okay, so to summarize this lecture, I have looked at modern plant biotechnology as a wake-up call for containment. So when we have plants which have been genetically modified, we must contain them and obtain approval before release. And in Malaysia, we have basically a Biosafety Act which governs all genetic modification. So non-compliance with this act can re result in termination of research as well as prosecution. And biorisk management is the key to ensuring the safe functioning of containment facilities. Now the AMP model or the risk assessment, risk mitigation and performance assessment is central to biorisk management and design considerations are essential when we develop facilities for containment. So this has been a general lecture on containment. I hope that you can address the various points in this lecture and I want you to post questions in the comment section and I will answer these comments and try to resolve your difficulties that you have faced in understanding this lecture. In the meantime, I wish you a safe containment yourself as we, this lecture is being delivered during the lockdown or what is known as movement control order. Please stay biosafe from and protect yourself from the COVID-19 virus. Thank you very much for participating in this lecture and I look forward to your feedback. Thank you.